This is my gift to you all. Christmas just passed. My 27th birthday on December 28th just passed. And now this is the very first video being uploaded in 2022, which should be an amazing year for Data Productions Media and everyone in this community. This gift is just a thank you for all the support, especially this last year, which was very transformative for my content and you know my future endeavors in this career path of my film production company, my uh, stock investments, data capital is now manifesting. So there's a lot of things happening on this channel, Data Productions Media, and I just love the support from you all. You guys have stayed with me throughout everything, the thick, the thin, we've laughed, we've cried. Um, and so I, I really appreciate that and that really hits home. And this is why I continually to work hard and it's for you guys and to keep ascending and uh, pushing a lot of the knowledge that we, we push on this channel forward. So this gift is all seven of my premium Patreon videos that I made in 2021, but it's going to be a compilation and you're going to get 10 minutes of each one. This is a long form over an hour video. So look, if you haven't supported the Patreon, that's okay. This is still a thank you for everybody uh, within the community. All right. So you have an hour long, about 10 minutes each of each documentary that I did. Banger, Gematria, Decodes, and hopefully you guys really soak it all in. Um, we're going to have a great year. I love you all. And as always, Art Turner, Data Productions Media, Dreams are tangible aspirations where we scheme our dreams into existence. Now, just sit back, relax, and enjoy. With Michael Jordan's documentary, The Last Dance. The final episode of The Last Dance aired on May 17, 2020, which had date numerology of 62, 26, and 17. Jordan equals 62 in ordinal and 26 in reduction. Here are some more codes in regards to The Last Dance documentary. The Last Dance, Chicago Bulls, and Stolen Ball all equal 112 in the English ordinal cipher. The NBA equals 112 in reverse ordinal. The steal on Carl Malone equals 112 in reverse reduction. And greatest basketball player ever equals 112 in septenary. The last dance equals 43 in Chaldean, which connects back to GOAT equaling 43 in ordinal. The last dance documentary equals 113 in keypad, which goes back to the National Basketball Association equaling 113 in the reduction. Michael Jordan ESPN documentary equals 450 in reverse ordinal, which connects to Michael Jordan having 45 points in his game six finale in a Bulls uniform. And one of the things I love so much about this documentary and reliving all these moments is we remember them as singular moments, but they forget the context. And one of those moments is the shot when you know games on the line game six championships on the line and he pushes off brian russell now what this documentary does such a good job of showing us is the layup in the possession that preceded that and then the defensive steal outsmarting stockton and malone in the defensive possession right before that and then the shot itself like i love that so much that layup when they were down by three to bring it to within one was not a gimme and not at all knew where the ball was going and what was going to happen when the ball got there. Everybody knew that ball was going to Michael and he was going to, if he got it in the right wing, he's either going to pull up and shoot or he's going to drive to the hoop. So two dribbles in, he's driving to the hoop and he had to go over like two or three, two and a half guys high off the glass. If he misses that shot, we're in over. game seven. And if we're in game seven, I don't think the Bulls win the title. I think they were out of gas. And I think he knew that at that moment too. So this is it. And ESPN made a 17 question poll asking people on who they thought was better after watching The Last Dance. 73% of the people said Jordan was still better than LeBron. 
the goat equals 73 in Jewish ordinal and Michael Jeffrey Jordan equals 73 in septenary. And if you take the dates from June 14th, 1998 to May 17th, 2020, from Jordan's sixth ring to the last dance finale is a total of 8,008 days. Michael Jordan, the last dance equals 88 in septenary, while Michael Jeffrey Jordan equals 88 in keypad. Now, let's talk about the steal Michael Jordan had on Carl Malone. The defense played by Jordan. Carl Malone, we've been trying to double team him. And Hornacek was trying to, I guess, pick Carl Malone. Left side. Hornacek screams across. He never really cleared, and which gave me an opportunity to go back. And Carl never saw me coming. Stockton against Kerr. Into Malone, low left. Malone had it chopped away by Jordan. Stolen by Jordan. Once I Carl turned his head, Michael turned, and I said, uh-oh, this got to be a steal. It's got to be a steal. You know where Jordan is at all times. You have to see him clear legitimately. Look. Watch. All right. Come on! Stockton, you can't see Jordan right there. Let me go back a little bit. Jordan, he's in the side of the line. Look, he's in the line of sight for Stockton. He, Jordan sees him. Look, come on. And he's already, you already see he's about to pass it when Jordan's never cleared. Never cleared. This is a no-no. Let's see what the gematria tells us. Fixed MBA equals 38 in the reduction cipher. Stockton knew Michael would steal ball equals 380 in ordinal, 137 in single reduction, where S equals 10, and 113 in septenary. Malone and Stockton knew Jordan would steal the ball equals 137 in septenary as well. Rigged NBA equals 35 in the keypad cipher, much like Jordan's age at the time of this championship game. So when I say the name Michael Jordan, what comes to mind? Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan. Carl knew Michael would steal a ball equals 305 in ordinal. John Stockton knew Michael would steal a ball equals 203 in reverse reduction. Carl Malone and John Stockton knew Michael would steal the ball equals 203 in Jewish reduction. Carl Malone and John Stockton knew Michael would steal the ball equals 203 in reduction and 230 in the KV reduction where K equals 11 and V equals 22 with emphasis of them being master numbers. Carl Malone knew Michael Jordan was going to steal the basketball in the post equals 230 in septenary, and Carl knew Michael was going to steal the basketball equals 2,300 in the Fibonacci cipher, which uses the Fibonacci sequence. As you see, these are all permutations of Michael Jordan's number of 23, where zero again is just a value placeholder. Talk to me about the Game 6 Finals in Utah when he stole the ball. Why? Why, why do I have to? But I tell you this, I'm all man, and I accept the responsibility for not winning one, and we was there. We just happened to be playing the Chicago Bulls, which wasn't just Michael Jordan, by the way. And I have the utmost respect for Michael, but I never thought I was playing Michael Jordan. <laughs> I was playing the Chicago Bulls, but let's not, you know, Everybody say this person was a bad man and all that. Well, yes, I give them respect, but I got a setup. I'm a man and I was a bad son of a bitch too. So that's how I look at that and, and that's who I am. Maybe in my older years, I can call it that bluntly, but I'm just calling it like I see it. Let's transition to the last shot and understand why this moment was so important to the folklore of the NBA. Before getting into the gematria of this sequence, let's uncover the backstory relationship between these two athletes. Brian Russell, when I was playing baseball, Utah was in town to play the Bulls. They're practicing at the facility. I go over and say hello to John and Carl. And this kid, Brian Russell, comes up to me and says, man, why you quit? Well, you quit. Man, you knew I could guard your ass. I couldn't, you, you had to quit. I said, Carl, you need to talk to this dude, man. 
Uh, he's just a young rookie. But from that point on, he's been on my list. And then 96 come around, and we had the jump ball circle, and he's like, Russell, he said, you remember that comment that you said to me back in 94? I was like, yeah, I'm going to stick to it. He's like, well, you're going to get your chance. Here comes Chicago, 17 seconds. Michael Jordan running on fumes with 45 points. To this day, Michael Jordan will not admit that with his left hand on the right butt cheek of Brian Russell, he <laughs> ushered him along down the lane. What do you think about that particular push off? His momentum was absolutely going that way. I don't think that he took him and, and pushed Brian Russell across the lane. I think that he knew he said in, in episode nine, he plays on the balls of his feet and he knows mm -hmm. how Brian plays defense. And he knows that if he jukes him, then he's going to go that way. I agree with Bob Costas when he says that it was like a mater D showing someone to their table. If you look mm -hmm. at that the low angle, nice video was not filmed. If that's the low angle shot, the slow-mo shot, his hand is clearly on Brian's body, but I don't think there's any, pressure being exerted to, to push him off. Now everybody said I pushed off. Bullshit. The man was, his energy was going that way. I didn't have to push him that way. Russell was already stumbling away. That hand on his backside was the equivalent of a major D showing someone to their table. From Jordan's 35th birthday to the famous game six shot was a total of 117 days apart. The last shot as a Chicago Bull equals 117 in the keypad cipher. Chicago Bulls championship equals 117 in the reduction cipher. The mirror of 35 is 53. The title of the scene, the push off equals 53 in the septenary cipher and 53 in keypad. NBA finals game six spelled out also equals 53 in the septenary cipher. And the last shot as a bull equals 53 in the reduction cipher. Crossover, look at Brian Russell slips, and Michael pulls up and buries the shot to give him a one-point lead. He has all the tricks. That's why it's so difficult to guard him. If that's the last image of Michael Jordan, how magnificent is it? Like People try to say, oh, that's a modern-day move right there where he kind of just guided him. Well, I don't know. His hand's straight on his butt, guiding him one direction. Cobb, Wagner, Matheson, and Johnson were deities in their own right. Babe Ruth is the god of baseball. In 1920, the Sultan of Swat was sold to the New York Yankees for $41,000. The new Yankee ushered in the decade with a bang, launching 54 home runs, an astronomical number for the time. He ruled the 1920s with his big bat and personality. And the Gematria backs it up. God and game both equal 26 in English ordinal. Sports, Yankees, and ball game all equal 26 in reduction. Babe equals 26 in reverse reduction. And the thing that Babe Ruth was known for, the home run, equals 26 in the septenary cipher. One of his nicknames, Sultan of Swat, equals 153 in reverse ordinal, while Major League Baseball equals 351 in reverse ordinal, and 351 is the 26th triangular number. Babe represents one pillar of baseball, while Jackie Robinson represents the other. A god in his own right, the shining light in baseball's history where he broke the color barrier. Unfortunately, we cannot talk about the history of blacks in mainstream history in America without the use of the number 42. <laughs> equals 42 in reduction, while Jackie equals 42 in reverse reduction. Jackie Robinson's jersey number was 42 as well. Branch Rickey, the major league executive that helped Jackie Robinson break the color barrier, was also a Freemason. And, non-coincidentally, Rickey was a part of the major leagues for 42 years. 
Brother Branch Rickey, from 1913 to 1955, 42 years in the game. He was the founder of the modern day farm system. He started it with the St. Louis Cardinals, where he was the manager for 17 years. That farm system is now copied by all teams today. Branch Rickey also invented the batting helmet. He encouraged the team to use batting cages, pitching machines, and that helmet. He was an advocate for expansion into new markets, and most notably, he brought Jackie Robinson to the Brooklyn Dodgers on April 15, 1947. He also <coughs> drafted the first Hispanic superstar, Roberto Clemente. It was his steadfast opposition to baseball's color barrier that would forever identify him as one of the game's great pioneers. He held from Lucasville 46, which became Belfield 688, which is Mount Vernon 688 now, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. That lodge is still in existence. 59 is also a big number for African Americans. Negro equals 59 in ordinal, while Jackie and Branch equal 59 in reduction. In 1885, the Cuban Guards were organized, becoming the first team of professional black ball players. Cuban Guards and Color Barrier both equal 42 in the septenary cipher. Jackie Robinson number 42 equals 108 in Chaldean, just like how Major League equals 108 in ordinal, and there's 108 stitches on a baseball. Jackie Robinson number 42 also equals 153 in keypad, which is the mirror of 351 in Major League Baseball in reverse ordinal. Jackie Robinson changed the majors equals 137 in keypad. Jackie Robinson changed Major League Baseball equals 731 in reverse ordinal, which is important because 731 is the reverse of 137. Another notable African American Hall of Fame baseball player was Willie Mays. Masons Among Us, brought to you by Michigan Masons. Nicknamed the Say Hey Kid, this Major League center fielder was elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1979. He won 12 gold gloves and made 24 All-Star Game appearances and is regarded as one of the game's greatest players. His name, Willie Mays, a proud member of the Masonic fraternity. Willie Mays equals 33 in the septenary cipher, and he wore number 24, which is the mirror of 42. He also played 22 seasons in the major leagues. Negro equals 22 in the reverse reduction cipher. We've got guys who uh, were responsible for helping fix the issue of segregation in baseball. Um, but uh, what a lot of people don't know is that baseball originally wasn't segregated. Uh, right after the Civil War, during the Reconstruction period, the United States was in a period of flux. This is the period where we see men of color being elected to Congress from states in the Deep South. Uh, and those men, some did serve, some did not actually wind up serving. Uh, and uh, kind of a weird period where we kind of see how the country as a whole is trying to solve these this new racial structure in the United States. Uh, and then in the 1870s and 80s, we start to see the rise of groups like the Ku Klux Klan. We start to see the rise of um, Jim Crow laws, and this leads to what's known as the Nader period, uh, which is the beginning of really strict segregation and uh, discrimination in the United States. Uh, but during that little period before the rise of the Nader is when we see African-American men playing professional baseball. Uh, the first African-American man we know playing professionally uh, it's worth noting, not the major league level. Incidentally, is from here in Cooperstown, which I think is pretty cool since we don't really have a real baseball connection since baseball wasn't invented here. Um, but he played minor league ball uh, and uh, never wanted to make it to the major leagues, but his name is uh, Bud Fowler. It's worth noting that at Double Day Field today, there's a large display denoting uh, the, the history of Bud Fowler and the streets both off of Main Street and off of the State Highway going into Doubleday Fields parking lot are both named Fowler way after him. Uh, but the first major leaguer to be uh, a man of color was Moses Fleetwood Walker. This is as far as we know. I'm not going to say that's a definite, but our records show that he is the first. So if anyone has uh, some earlier, please do bring that uh, information forward. We'd love to have it. Uh, but Moses Fleetwood Walker, as far as we know, uh, first man of color to play Major League Baseball. And... Uh, him and a few others, including his brother Weldy, played at the major league level. Uh, but as we see the rise of the Nader period in the United States, where we see you know segregation occurring 
in large portions of the country. Uh, same thing starts to happen in baseball. We have teams who refuse to play the Toledo Blue Stockings, which is the team that uh, um, Walker played for, and we start to see, um, as a result of that, leagues. The International League was the first that I know of in uh, 1887. Uh, so four years after Walker integrates uh, the majors, uh, we see the International Association or the International League as we know it today uh, was the first to have a gentleman's agreement. So no written, uh, no written communication, but uh, they agreed they would not renew the contracts of any black ball players. Uh, and that led to a lack of any men of color playing Major League Baseball by 1900, establishes the um, the color barrier that Jackie Robinson famously broke in 1947. Uh, so uh, at that point, teams start forming up teams um, of just men of color playing, and uh, they barnstorm across the country, kind of like what the Harlem Globetrotters do today. They'd go into a community, say, we're here to play. Who wants to play us? And charge admission and put on a pretty good show for the fans. His name, his name was uh, Jerry Erickson. He was a brother out of California, and his hobby was to find every single person related to baseball that was a Mason. That doesn't mean baseball players. That means TV or radio announcer, a writer, an umpire, anyone who had a connection to Major League Baseball that was a Mason, he wanted to compile a list. Uh, the list I have here says final list, 561. I know for a fact this is not the final list because uh, um, after finding this list and it piqued my interest, I started doing some more research into it and found out that the Grand Lodge of New York uh, in its uh, Livingston Library, which has a small museum, had a small exhibit on Masons and baseball. So I reached out to uh, the library and the, uh, the librarian there who had done the research for that. And sure enough, the Grand Lodge of New York's library has a larger number. I believe it's 600 and something. I don't quite remember the number. And I haven't been able to get a hold of that copy again since uh, I did that initial research. If you look at the peak years of numbers of masonry, uh, I believe the uh, MSA says that the highest year was 1950 for the number of Masons in the United States. That coincides pretty closely with the peak years for baseball, so you're going to pick up a few guys there. Uh, but also I think it really comes down to the fact that these men were traveling regularly for work. In a 162-game season, which is what they currently play, they're playing half of those on the road, uh, so they can have a sense of family even when they're away from their family at home. You know, if it's a Prince Hall affiliate or if it's a, a, a four-letter or three-letter Grand Lodge, it can take a lot of time just to figure out if one guy was amazing. And if you didn't already know, Abner Doubleday didn't invent baseball. Abner Doubleday didn't invent baseball equals 108 in the septenary cipher, just like how geometry and major league both equal 108 in ordinal with the 108 stitches in a baseball. Seems like the Doubleday story was a scripted hoax the whole time. How would you like a ticket to one of the most influential forms of mass communication the world has ever known? The most influential forms of mass communication the world has ever known. It's a universal language that lets us tell stories about our collective hopes and fears to make sense of the world around us and the people around us. I'm talking about film. This powerful medium sits in a sweet spot of human culture at the intersection of art, industry, technology, and politics. It's inescapable. It's inescapable, like FBI piracy warnings and trailers that give away the entire movie. <laughs> The term film was first used to describe a specific technology, a thin, flexible material coated in light-sensitive emulsion that retains an image after it's exposed to light. It's also the end product of that photochemical process. A film is a movie. But it's also a verb to describe the process of capturing moving pictures, as in, I'm gonna film a movie today, or Nick is filming me right this very second, or I'm gonna film a film on film. Over time, the original film technology has switched to analog and digital substitutes, first things like VHS or beta, and eventually digital video, like when you record something on your phone. Now, at the very beginning of history, before all these innovations existed, film started out as a collection of still images viewed one after another in rapid succession, which creates the illusion of motion. It was a magic trick. It was a magic trick. And from that trick came an art form that's a blend of literature, drama, photography, and music. So how does this illusion actually work? It all comes down to a couple quirks of human perception. Tricks your eyes play on your brain, or your brain plays on your eyes, or maybe both. Tricks your eyes play on your brain? or your brain plays on your eyes, or maybe both. Warner Brothers was incorporated in 1923 by the four brothers, Harry, Albert, Sam, and Jack. The brothers got by on multiple bank loans, paying their bills with cash borrowed from bootleggers, 
and other loan sharks with exorbitant interest rates. For years, the studio failed to meet its monthly payments and overheads on time. But then, Sam Warner found the game changer to not only their studio, but the industry and world at large. In 1925, the brothers started their own radio station. The Department of Commerce assigned them the call sign KFWB. And in that same year, Sam Warner purchased a movie sound system called Vitaphone. Most movies to that point in time had sound effects and music, but none had audible dialogue. Sam was convinced that dialogue would change the industry for the better, and he wasn't wrong. On October 6th, 1927, at their theater in Times Square, New York City, Warner Bros. premiered the first ever movie containing dialogue. It was called The Jazz Singer, and it starred Al Jolston. The first words ever spoken in a movie were all ad-libbed by him. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You ain't heard nothing yet. Wait a minute, I tell you. You ain't heard nothing. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You ain't heard nothing yet. Wait a minute, I tell you. You ain't heard nothing. You want to hear Toot Toot Tootsie? All right. Hold on. Hold on. Lou, listen. Play Toot Toot Tootsie. Three chorus, you understand? And the third chorus, I whistle. Now give it to him hard and heavy. Go right ahead. <laughs> Wait a minute, wait a minute, you ain't heard nothing yet. Wait a minute, I tell ya, you ain't heard nothing. On the surface, a normal person wouldn't think much of this dialogue, but it was history making and it caused a sensation. Ironically, none of the brothers were present for this landmark moment. The man who started it all with dialogue had died from a stroke the day before the premiere and the entire family was at home mourning. Do you believe that to be the case? Remember. These uber elite families are ritualistic in nature because they love the power they can wield when casting magical spells selfishly for themselves. What really drove Warner Brothers into their future and what changed the business was that they were the first studio to really get sound talking on film. And um, it was a tough haul. And Sam Warner, one of the brothers, died in the process. The brothers all said, oh, he worked so hard to get sound. He, he just wore himself out and he died because of that. If you look closely into what happened, you do discover that he had a head full of rotten teeth. And I think that had something to do with his death. But the Warner brothers told stories and they told legends from the beginning. So Sam is now still uh, regarded as the man who introduced sound and suffered for it. But sound set them off. It is my personal belief Sam was ritualistically sacrificed. I find it odd that the godfather of dialogue in movies would die the night before the premiere of his groundbreaking work. The odds of that happening are slim to none. What confirms it for me, the lines Al Jolson spoke in The Jazz Singer are systematically encoded. Wait a minute, wait a minute, you ain't heard nothing yet. Wait a minute, wait a minute, I tell ya, you ain't heard nothing. Was a spell ritual equals 333 in the Chaldean cipher, which is very powerful because the Chaldean cipher is scientifically based off numerical matches with letters and their natural sound vibrations, which is what dialogue is all about, it's sound vibrations, sound magic. As the years went along and the dominance grew, Jack became the last surviving brother when Albert passed away in Miami Beach, Florida in November 1967. Four months earlier in July, Jack spent his last working day at the studio, having sold his share of the company to Seven Arts for $32 million. Once again, very eerily, Jack's final day at Warner's coincided with the arrival of a 22-year-old film student from the University of Southern California, a young man about to start a paid internship as a winner of the Sam Warner Scholarship. His name was George Lucas. 
As old Hollywood drove out the gates, new Hollywood drove in. Isn't that interesting? As Jack Warner descended from being the last standing Warner at the studio, his final day, they brought in 22-year-old, emphasis on 22, George Lucas. That is not by accident. The reason why legendary Star Wars director is legendary is because he was propped up to be. The Warners put him through the mystery schools of how to use magic within film, and then the media made him look like a film genius. Ritualistic in nature, just like the death of Sam Warner. Jack, the youngest, goes to the two brothers, Albert and Harry, and says, look guys, you're getting on. You deserve to retire. You deserve to take some fruits from all you've done. You built the studio up from nothing. It's an extraordinarily profitable entity. Suppose we actually sell it to someone. And he persuaded them that that was a good move. And he said, you trust me, I'll, I'll set the deal up. So he, he goes away, talks to bankers, and a deal is made from which all the brothers got big sum of money. But Jack arranged the deal so that two days or three days after it had been made, he would become president of the new Warner Brothers. The very thing that Harry had said over my dead body. And he was dead in a couple of years. And the people in the family, his widow, said it broke his heart and that Jack really killed him. Uh, it was a nasty piece of work. And, and um, you have to face it for what it was. And there is a little bit of uh, epilogue to that story. I'm sorry, what's that? Well, the epilogue to the story is that when Har Harry had a stroke, oh. and then he passed away, and Jack was in Europe yeah. Oh, yeah. at yeah. the time. And, and did not come back for the funeral. And a few days later, he was in a near-fatal car crash. That's right. It's an extraordinary story. Yeah. So when he did come back to the studio, there was a big welcome back Jack uh, flag over the main gate, I would say, um, probably on Barham. Yeah. Uh, and uh, by that time, the studio had really shifted from making a few films a year to being the king, really, of the first studio to really embrace television. Absolutely. Yeah. And Warner Brothers Television to this day is uh, by far the leader of any studio putting programming on network television. And to end it off properly with how we started, the famous WB Frog's catchy phrase was, Mark up the big screen and watch the WB. Yeah. Spark up the big screen and watch the WB Frog equals 144 in Chaldean, which once again is the sound vibration cipher, which goes back to who is really controlling the things that we consume with our eyes and ears. The story of blacks already being in America is played out by the only three black quarterbacks to win the Super Bowl in the National Football League. Doug Williams, Russell Wilson, and Patrick Mahomes played for the Washington Redskins, Seattle Seahawks, and Kansas City Chiefs, respectively. All three QBs to win the Super Bowl played for Native American-themed mascots. Blacks were in America before Christopher Columbus came, and the true black history in America is told via pro sports, both equal 220 in the reduction cipher, while false scripting equals 220 in the reverse ordinal cipher, which all goes back to the Jesuits equaling 22 in reduction. Remember, zero is just the value placeholder, so 220 is the same as 22. The Jesuits control the storyline in sports equals 222 in the reverse reduction cipher, while Doug Williams, Russell Wilson, and Patrick Mahomes, and pro sports storylines tell the real history, both equaling 222 in the keypad cipher, along with 
The real history of America is told through sports, equaling 222 in Jewish reduction. And the real history of America is told through sports storylines, equaling 222 in the Septenary Cipher. Redskins, Seahawks, and Chiefs are black Native Americans, equal 303 in reverse reduction, while the phrase from Christopher Columbus landing to Douglas Williams winning, also equaling 303 in the reverse reduction cipher. False script from Jesuit equals 303 in reverse ordinal as well. Gigantic stone heads in central Mexico. The Olmec civilization was the first significant civilization in Mesoamerica deemed mother culture of Mexico by some historians. This civilization, dominated by Africans, is best known for the colossal carved heads in central Mexico that served as even more evidence that Africans sailed to the New World before Columbus. Africans sailed to the New World before Columbus. The heads are clearly crafted in the likeness of Africans. Africans had ships. In fact, they had four kinds of vessels. Uh, and Nubian pottery, uh, this is an example of a Nubian pottery with a painting on it that shows a long-hold pottery. Art! That, uh, that shows either a long-hold boat or a papyrus raft or a, a, a hauled-out canoe. And then this other uh, painting beside it is from, uh, the first one was um, from 3000 BC. And this is a bird's eye view of an oared riverboat in Chad. And it dates from 3500 BCE. The Africans of Guinea also had dugout canoes hewn from these monumental trees on the coast there. In 1500, 1500 it's just a few years after Columbus's voyage, the Portuguese captain uh, Pacheco Pereira wrote, in this country can be found the largest canoes made of a single trunk. Some are so large that they hold 80 men. Now, the West Africans were known to lash two dugout canoes together, side by side, and no one questions the seaworthiness of a similar type of Polynesian catamarans. Well, here's a 15th century Portuguese painting of sailing canoes on the Congo estuary. The Portuguese, like Captain Pereira, had heard that African traders were visiting Brazil in the mid-1400s. So to demonstrate that mariners from West Africa could have sailed to the Americas using papyrus vessels as early as 2000 BCE, Norwegian uh, adventurer Tor Heyerdahl actually used ancient shipbuilding techniques in order to construct and sail the Ra 1 and the Ra 2 in 1969 and 70. And generally, some type of sailing vessel um, will average about 100 miles per day, even without sails. And in an ocean current, uh, something like a raft or a reed boat can, uh, can average about 60 miles a day. Now, Islamic historian Amir Hajib reported that voyages west from Mali were happening in the year 1311, just uh, 150 years before Columbus. Further evidence of blacks in America long before anyone else can be found in the Pueblo Cliff Dwellings in Colorado. Now these dwellings, the Pueblo Cliff Dwellings, is now a tourist attraction in Colorado. These dwellings were built thousands upon thousands of years before anyone else populated this area. Now this is a picture of cliff dwellings found in Mali, in Africa today. The exact same cave dwellings built by the Africans in Mali. So while well, this story seems to describe the trade wind driven equatorial current or the canary current, you can see it's very easy for, uh, for Africans from the south and the Angola region and the Angola regions to come up towards the equator and going west westwards or from the western coast of Africa north of the equator to go eastwards along that same current. At least a dozen explorers, including Constantine Ravenes, reported seeing blacks upon reaching the New World. In fact, in 1513, Spanish explorer Vasco Nunez de Balboa, when Balboa was there, he said he met members of a tribe of Ethiopians in Panama. And according to Balboa's log, these men came from a totally black village that was two days journey away and he figured that these blacks had come from Ethiopia uh, at a much earlier date. So there are also examples of physical evidence including pre-Columbian African skeletons which have been found throughout the Americas. Now dating between 800 BCE and 300 CE, these murals are from the Temple of the Warriors at Chichen Itza. Historian Samuel D. Marble wrote, 
As a subject for research, the possibility of African discovery of America has never been a tempting one for American historians. We choose our own history, or more accurately, we select those vistas of history that more or less uh, kind of explain to have the promise of the greatest satisfaction to, for ourselves. And we have had little appetite to explore the possibility that our founding father was a black man. We do want to point out that there is evidence of other races in the Americas prior to the arrival of Columbus. There were Asians, Pacific Islanders, and there's even evidence of Europeans before Columbus. Let's talk about the teams these three Super Bowl winning quarterbacks played for and how it can relate to American history. Doug Williams and Russell Wilson beat the Denver Broncos in their Super Bowls. The Bronco is white. A Bronco is a type of horse not a species or a breed. It comes from the Spanish Broncos, which means rough. American cowboys borrowed the lingo from their Mexican counterparts to describe untrained or partially trained horses. A white Bronco symbolizes the cowboys of the Western frontier. That same old and tired cowboys and Indian script played out once again, but with the subconscious twist of black natives. Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs played the San Francisco 49ers who represent the white gold prospectors who invaded California. Because so many people forgot about the Native Americans involvement in the California's gold rush, it's important to discover the truth by asking the question, what were the consequences of the California gold rush on the Native Americans living in the region? But during the California gold rush, Native Americans were subject to California's policies, which enabled the Native American population to be devastated by genocide, enslavement, disease, and displacement by those who took advantage of them. Many of these Native American deaths were caused by laws California enacted, which encouraged, if not permitted, the killing of Native Americans. There were California Blacks, or Califians, also referred to as Califians, spelt with a K-H, the California Blacks were one of the largest and oldest native nations in the Americas. They were the people Europeans originally referred to as the Red Man. They were the people Europeans originally referred to as the Red Man. One account of what it was really like in California comes from the writing of historian Robert Beverly from the 1700s. He writes, far and away the most beautiful city on earth five times the size of London or Rome, great towers and buildings rising from the water, 60,000 gleaming houses, how spacious and well-built they were, of beautiful stonework and cedar wood and wood of other sweet scented trees. Many streets and boulevards were so neat and well swept despite the multitude of inhabitants crisscross with a complete network of channels like an enormous Venice, but also remarkable floating gardens that remain from nowhere else on earth. So you see, black Native Americans not only lived here, but we thrived here. And we thrived for thousands of years before Columbus. The original indigenous inhabitants of California were the descendants of West Africa, South America's Omeka Zai Empire, 1500 to 400 BCE, Egypt, Asia, and the Pacific Islands, creating a mixed cultural nation that thrived for thousands of years in peace. The coast of California. Do these people look like they've ever been in captivity? Are we to believe that these people were kidnapped from somewhere in Africa and brought all the way to California? I hope this presentation has given you enough information to spark you to do your own research. And when you do your own research, you will come to the same conclusions that I have, that African Americans ain't African. However, there is another black group, a pre-Columbian black group in the Americas, mostly along the West Coast, California, uh, what is now Acapulco, of a black group of people who do not trace their ancestry to Africa. Both gentlemen are facing what could be substantial prison time. Kendricks and Sinoiki used a variety of methods to disguise their scheme. For example, after Kendricks set up the new brokerage account, he and Sinoiki used 
coded language in a text discussing the arrival of the initial $80,000 into the account, pretending instead that the text was about changing the number on Kendrick's jersey from 95 to 80. Similarly, shortly after their first successful trade, Sinoiki sent Kendrick's a text message to arrange to get a kickback by asking for bread, claiming in the text to prefer the bread used for Philly cheesesteaks over the bread in New York City. In what we allege was an attempt to conceal these kickbacks, Kendrick's paid Sinoiki in cash and celebrity perks. The cash payments were made at in-person meetings, including one at 30th Street Station, where Sinoiki rode the train to pick up his money. Some of the perks included things like tickets to Eagles games and arranging for Sinoiki to visit Kendrick's on the set of a pop star's music video. Insider trading threatens investor confidence in the fairness and integrity of our markets. We will continue to dedicate our resources to pursuing insider traders and holding them accountable regardless of their celebrity or their status. Regardless of their celebrity or their status. Of course, being a famous athlete would afford you an opportunity to not so known information in the business world. Would you not use that to your advantage if you were an athlete? Why isn't the SEC looking into this? President Joe Biden is replacing the entire fleet of 645,000 federal vehicles with electric ones. Obviously, government-backed Tesla is at the top of the list for the provider. This does create conflict of interest. It's Nancy Pelosi's job to work to pass these environmental and clean energy initiatives initiatives from which her family is now profiting handsomely off of. The TV series on Showtime Billions accurately depicts the financial world on Wall Street and how it operates. Games within games, chess moves after chess moves. Billions on Showtime accurately represents how corrupt Wall Street is equals 333 in single reduction, while the show Billions shows the government connection in the finance world equals 303 in reverse reduction. While many things change within this show, one thing always remains constant. Everyone always has inside information. Insider information is key in finance world equals 133 in septenary. Insider information is a commodity in the financial world equals 3,330 in English Sumerian and conflict of interest is always present as well. Billions portrays that nicely. The Attorney General of the United States' wife is the psychologist for the largest investment fund in the world. These two worlds are not supposed to have any connection because of the integrity of the markets. Part of Hollywood movie magic is the creator's ability to hide the gruesome truth in plain sight for the audience to consume their reality without them consciously knowing it. This is how the elite get away with everything that they do. They made movies seem unrealistic in your eyes, so you wouldn't consider it to be an option in your actual reality. Do you see the game being played? Think about how billions can be connected to the Robin Hood, GameStop, and Citadel scandal in a crazy so-called coincidence that caused an uproar of conflict of interest. But was it a coincidence or a possible real-life sick joke at society? Twitter users have drawn a connection between Pisaki and a Citadel employee named Jeff Pisaki, claiming that they are husband and wife or brother and sister. The speculation of Jen and Jeff's relationship began after people worried about a conflict of interest between Yellen, and later Pisaki, when advising President Joe Biden on the GameStop situation. Jen Pisaki is not married to Jeff Pisaki. She's married to Gregory Mecker. In a statement to Newsweek, a source close to Jeff said Jen and Jeff Pisaki are distant second cousins but have no relationship and have never met or spoken to each other. A source close to Jen Pisaki confirmed that Jen does not have a relationship with Jeff and has no plans to start one. We talked about how Wendy Rhodes is the psychologist at Axe Capital while being married to the U.S. Attorney General. She could be seen as Jen Pisaki, playing both sides of the field, one foot in the White House and one foot in Citadel. 
Even if it was only symbolically a false story in the mainstream airwaves, upon further research, maybe that fake story was supposed to tell us something after all. Just like the show. Jennifer Renee Pisaki is an American political advisor serving as the 34th in current White House press secretary. Jen Psaki is Wendy Rhodes equals 340 in reverse ordinal. Having a conflict of interest equals 139 in reverse reduction, which is fascinating because 139 is the 34th prime. I don't believe this was a coincidence. I believe it was the Matrix telling us the truth via Gematria once again. Mr. Griffin, Citadel's role in this event also raises significant questions for policymakers. Citadel Securities pays Robinhood tens of millions of dollars to process trades by Robinhood's customers. This relationship gives Citadel Enterprise key non-public information as to direction and volume of trades by retail investors. Your firm makes use of private exchanges called dark pools and other, um, and other um, off-exchange trading to trade large sizes without moving the market against you. In fact, at some point last month, 50% of all trades occurred in dark pools or via OTC off exchange trades. Your business strategy is designed intentionally to undermine market transparency and skim profits from companies and other investors. One problem though, Mr. Griffin, is that we don't really know how central your firm has become to the capital markets. Mr. Griffin, does Citadel handle 47% of the US listed retail volume? Please, yes or no. Excuse me. Uh Chairman Waters, what, what percentage? I couldn't hear that number. 47%. So, Chairman Waters, to the best yes, of my knowledge. Yes, I know. Uh, so, the odd, to the best of my knowledge, we handle in excess of roughly 40% of all retail volume. Thank you very much for reclaiming my time. News as of October 22nd, 2021, the Federal Reserve announced sweeping new rules for its top officials banning trading in individual stocks and bonds. Even though on paper, this rule is great and hinders the conflict of interest theory, but do you really think they won't find a loophole behind this? If so, you are not seeing the game for what it is, filled with traps and deception for you to part with the one thing that can really help you elevate your spiritual ascension, money. You're living in the biggest game of Monopoly. The stock market is the largest device of wealth transfer in the world. This device could be a dream come true, or it can be a nightmare. Polarity is an absolute constant in our world, so money is no different. And we can see the proof within the gematria, but it revolves around a specific number. 52. Stock market and 5-2 both equal 37 in reduction and 37 in the Chaldean cipher. Monopolies and currencies equals 52 in the reduction cipher, while money traps and billions equals 52 in the reverse reduction cipher. And on the flip side, freedom points, freedom tokens, and chance of living all equal 52 in the septenary cipher, as you see, money traps you or sets you free. It's the intentions with it that you seek. And we should see the elites. It said it's magic. He was a star when, when he first arrived here, coming off the NC2A game. His leadership was his mind. Now let's look at the light pillar of Joaquin marked with the J. This is the solar pillar, and these are the qualities that are pretty readily uh, able to be seen by others. Magic Johnson was living on a natural high. He was starring in the role of a lifetime, point guard of a Hollywood team with an offense called Showtime. The power of the holly. Think of one of the most uh, successful areas of creative energy and business in the world. It's Hollywood. He even had the alter ego perfect for the production. I mean, Magic was his stage name. Even he would laugh about it. 
The Great White Hope. What does that mean? Well, you know, it's very hard to say because there's a lot of great white players. When the owl spirit animal wings into your awareness, it's time to tap into your deepest self. Sometimes truths can be hidden. Either we're blind to them, or darkness cloaks the real story. But such curtness was hardly strange coming from Larry Bird, who was not only one of college basketball's best players, but also its biggest enigma. I have to deal with that. The B stands for Boaz, which is what this pillar is referred to as in Freemasonry, the pillar of Boaz. These are the pillars that were outside of the temple of Solomon because the seal of Solomon, or what is known as the Star of David, as the previous caller also mentioned, is the unification, stands for the unification of the spiritual and the material, and the unification of the masculine and the feminine, okay? It is ultimately about the unification of our emotions and our actions. That's ultimately what this symbol represents. The top of the pillar of um, Boaz there, underneath the moon, because this is the lunar or feminine side, okay? These are about innate aspects, all right? The unseen, that which is not carried on the outside, but that which is pretty much dwelling within us. What the dark occultists, who are ultimately the masters of this reality right now, as it stands, that is unfortunately true, that is unfortunately the case, they are controlling the entire game here, so to speak. The reason they are able to do this is because they are in possession of this information which they have subsequently occulted from the rest of humanity. The occult is simply information that has been hidden. Occult ideas became embedded in the traditions of secret societies, such as the Freemasons and the Rosicrucians. They were tending to do them uh, passed on among secret brotherhoods and organizations because these are very powerful and dangerous ideas, dangerous to status quo, dangerous to institutionalized religion. So there's a, an element of underground secrecy associated with some of these themes. These havens of safety began to flourish across Europe. Secret societies were instrumental in the new age of enlightenment that swept through Europe in the 1700s and even helped in the founding of American democracy. The fame of the secret societies of Yale College, or for their detractors their notoriety, springs from the confluence of four circumstances of their existence. First is the large shadow cast by Yale in our country's political history for half the 19th and all the 20th centuries. The second is the sustained prominence over almost two centuries of the society's initiates in all phases of American life about to be discussed here in more detail. And third, not to be overlooked, the proximity of New Haven to New York City, the nation's social, financial, and media capital, resulting in frequent press reports of society elections and the controversies surrounding them. The final circumstance, maybe why you're here, but that's all right, is the provoking secrecy maintained by their initiates after being tapped the New York Times entitled an article, Nude Wrestling, Good Practice for Politics. <laughs> this opening managed to marry the description of a legendary ritual of skull and bones, about which you will not hear today. Membership in a senior society at Yale has long been both a reward for undergraduate leadership on the campus, a reward bestowed by outgoing seniors on upcoming juniors, not by the faculty, and a spur to further achievement in after college life and Yale College outstripped all its rivals, including Harvard, which was almost seven decades older, in the category of statesmen. The cyclopedia concluded, Yale seems to be more American than Harvard. <laughs> Public life, politics, statesmanship represent a very important part of American life. Therefore, a larger number of distinguished men of Yale do we find in statesmanship than of Harvard. And the Harvard philosopher George Santayana wrote only a year before in the Harvard Monthly, no wonder all America loves Yale, where American conditions are vigorous, American instincts unchecked, and young men are trained and made ready for the keen struggles of American life. Their initiates have gone on in the political world 
be governors, ambassadors, Supreme Court chief justices, CIA directors, secretaries of state, war defense, and treasury, including Trump's, and of course, presidents. In the arts, they've won Pulitzer Prizes and Academy Awards and Emmys. At the university itself, the philanthropists among them have gifted the first 12 residential colleges, Sterling Library, the Law and Divinity School buildings, and the Yale Center for British Art. Almost 50 years ago, the anthropologist Lionel Tite, in his book, Men in Groups, told us that, quote, secret societies are the consequence of an effort of individuals, usually and mainly men, to create the social conditions for exercising their gregarious propensities, the expression of which may be, or may seem to be, inhibited by the community. Now, add to this the allure of exclusive membership and the rapid social elevation in the adult world of what became best known of such groups, the Masons, and you have, in the new world, all the ingredients for the blossoming of fraternities, which in early 19th century America, I suspect you don't know, were alternatively called, without opprobrium, secret societies, and which by mid-century were building windowless fraternity houses at brand new colleges. Conversely, the Masons in America had flourished, but become more controversial. When a former member threatened exposure of their secrets, he was murdered, wrapped in chains, and sunk to the bottom of Lake Niagara, with his murderers acquitted in a courtroom run by a Masonic judge and packed with Masons. They teach magicians to control the crowd with their eyes. Wherever the magician's eyes goes, the crowd will follow which means the magician's tricks, or properly termed experiments, are actually outside of the eyesight of the viewer and himself. The art of magic deals with the implementation of illusion. The magician is an actor acting like he is a person with supernatural powers, but in reality, he just knows how to manipulate his environment, which then manipulates the crowd in shock and awe of his experiments. The funny thing about professional sports, and more specifically, the National Basketball Association, is that its storyline scripting is nothing short of magical. If you ask an average person on the street and ask them where they would think the rigging of the NBA would take place, they would say Los Angeles, California. Hollywood, with the shining lights, bright stars, and storied Lakers. But always remember, the magician's eyes are telling you where they want you to look so they can perform their acts out of sight and out of most people's minds. I will present to you the real magicians of the National Basketball Association and possibly the whole American sports industrial complex. Follow me down the rabbit hole as I uncover the real magicians and their tricks over the sports enthusiast's mind. But first, a poem. The teller of tales, creating the storylines from east to west with the wind behind his sails. When the magician tells you to look here, then there, just know the experiment is being accomplished elsewhere to keep you in the dark like the elf on the shelf until the present is perfectly wrapped for you. These kinds of magicians aren't wanting to just entertain you. They want to entrain you then contain you mentally. The best magicians never leave anything up to chance, captivating you in a way where you won't ever see outside of the show, and you won't even know. The true magicians of the NBA. But in this documentary, that ends today. My gift to you is to unglue the backboard holding the contraption of the National Basketball Association together, which Interestingly enough, leads us to a place with snowier weather. Before going into the final decodes, I want to read a few passages from the book Our Magic, written by legendary magicians Neville Maskelin and David Devant, on the topic of misdirection, which we can see in the NBA with the the misdirection which forms the groundwork of real magic does not consist in telling lies, with the object of deceiving the spectator's intelligence, which in most cases is what happens when watching professional sports. 
real magic consists, admittedly in misleading the spectator's senses in order to screen from detection certain details from which secrecy is required. A magician should be able to see almost everything he can need to see without actually looking at it. Misdirection by disguise consists in a skillful blending of suspicious and innocent details in such a manner that the former are overlooked. In other words, it depends upon making quote-unquote fakey things look as though they were free from sophistication. The real inwardness of this principle is far too often unrecognized by magicians, though an audience will never lose sight of it. It is not enough to have the sophistications hidden by blobs, thickness, or deformities of quote-unquote decoration, so the spectators cannot see what is underneath. On the contrary, magical appliances should be so constructed that their inner devices are not concealed by a mere covering of some sort, but are disguised by blending with the general structure. In fact, so far from suggesting the possibility of there being anything discoverable, a magician's accessories should rather look like objects of normal construction, which nobody would associate with trickery. If the simulation be not good, spectators cannot be expected to believe that the object simulated is where it is supposed to be. In short, every sense is open to misdirection, and thus may be made to serve the ends of a skillful magician. Join my Patreon today for only $5 to receive a monthly esoteric documentary on your favorite sports athletes and events. Real, raw, uncut, and uncensored without the limitations of YouTube. Join today to see the other side of the sports world.